I think often people vacillate between two different types of love and one involves accepting other people like loving them as they are and the other aspect of love is, is wanting someone to achieve their potential and to, to flourish and I mean we think when we talk about love about romantic relationships and stuff there are many forms of love the best template for love generally parental love if you think about your relationship with your own children you know it's easier to understand this tension between accepting them for who they are but also wanting them to grow into something better and to, to, to achieve their potential. What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Artists of Data Science podcast, the only self-development podcast for data scientists. You're going to learn from and be inspired by the people, ideas, and conversations that will encourage creativity and innovation in yourself so that you can do the same for others. I also host Open Office Hours. You can register to attend by going to bitly.com forward slash a D S O H. I look forward to seeing you all there. Let's ride this beat out into another awesome episode. And don't forget to subscribe to the show and leave a five star review. Our guest today is a philosopher and psychotherapist with a special interest in stoicism and cognitive behavioral therapy. As a trainer, he specializes in e-learning and web development, taking an evidence-based approach to the treatment of anxiety and the relationship between ancient philosophy and modern psychotherapy. In addition to being involved in research on the use of e-learning as a vehicle for delivering training and self-help, He's the author of six books on philosophy and psychotherapy and one upcoming graphic novel. So please help me in welcoming our guest today, author of Stoicism and the Art of Happiness and How to Think Like a Roman Emperor, Donald J. Robertson. Donald, thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule to be on the show today. Well, thank you very much for having me on the show. It's a pleasure to be here, and I'm, I'm very much looking forward to our conversation. Oh, same here, man. I'm super, super excited. <laughs> Before we jump into the philosophy of Marcus Aurelius, let's learn a little bit about you. So where did you grow up, and what was it like there? Um, well, I'm from Scotland, as you could probably tell. I grew up on, on the west coast of Scotland in a town called Ayr. And uh, I lived there until I was uh, about 19, 20, when I went to university in Aberdeen for four years. And then I lived in England for many years before emigrating to Canada about six or seven years ago now, although I get around a bit these days. And at the moment, I'm living in Athens in Greece. So how is living in Athens in, in Greece like? Have you been able to get out much? How's the, the situation there with, with COVID? Oh, it's a good place to be. It's not been hit too badly by COVID and there's quite an outdoor culture here. It's still very warm here. It's about 30 degrees today. Oh, wow. Um, so it's a bit easier to kind of go out and explore outdoors and stuff. A lot better than the negative 10 in Winnipeg right now. Oh, is it really? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's quite cold. <laughs> Actually, <yeah>. wow. <laughs> So when you're in high school, what did you think your future would look like? Um, I was a kind of dropout from the school. Um, so I, honestly, I really believed that uh, my future was pretty bleak. I thought I was going to end up being a criminal or uh, like just... Um, I, when I was a boy growing up, this is before the internet. So my horizons were very limited. Um, you know, the guys that grew up in my town who came from blue collar families, got blue collar jobs and they, they didn't have the same sense of social mobility. And uh, I remember when I was a kid speaking to a careers guidance counselor, well, probably when I was about 17 or something, and I said, I, I've been reading Freud and uh, I wanted to be a psychotherapist. And the counselor said, well, that's just a crazy idea. Like it costs a lot of money to train in that. It's only middle class families that can afford 
uh, for their kids to do stuff like that. She said, you should get an apprenticeship as a mechanic or something like that, you know, while you still got the chance to do it. And so she thought this was the craziest idea that she'd uh, ever heard in her life. And uh, for some reason, I guess I walked away from that a little bit downcast, but a day or two later, I decided that I didn't agree with her and I went ahead and did it anyway. So how different is life now than you had imagined it would be? Or is this pretty much the future you had envisioned for yourself? Well, my life now is very different. Um, when I was a boy, I had no idea. Um, I could never have imagined that uh, my life would be like it is now. I thought it would be uh, like my father's life. My father worked on building sites. And my mother was a cleaner. And our family were quite poor. My father passed away when I was about 13, 14 years old. And so my, my mother was a widow. Uh, she brought me up when I was at high school. Uh, she cleaned the teacher's houses for a living. Uh, so uh, we, uh, we came from quite a poor uh, background. And uh, I could never have imagined that I'd end up being a professional writer and psychotherapist and all that kind of stuff and traveling the world and things. Um, so talk to us now about your experience then as a practicing psychotherapist and how did that lead you to stoicism? Mm -hmm. um, well, I kind of became interested in stoicism because I, I went to university to study academic philosophy um, and I wanted to find a job at the end of it and uh, someone suggested to me that being a psychotherapist was a, a good job um, for a, uh, someone with a background in philosophy and uh, you know so that was uh, so what I got into I pursued training as a counsellor and psychotherapist and uh, you know I, then I realised that stoicism was the type of philosophy that inspired cognitive behavioural therapy and so everything kind of came together for me. I saw the connection between uh, philosophy and psychotherapy and a particular type of philosophy that ended up spending the, the rest of my life studying. What's up, artists? I would love to hear from you. Feel free to send me an email to theartistsofdatascience at gmail.com. Let me know what you love about the show. Let me know what you don't love about the show. And let me know what you would like to see in the future. I absolutely would love to hear from you. I've also got open office hours that I will be hosting. And you can register by going to bitly.com com forward slash a d s o h i look forward to hearing from you all and i look forward to seeing you in the office hours let's get back to the episode yeah i first came into contact with stoicism through cbt as well i was reading a book called feeling good and mm -hmm. in doing research for that it just kind of you know like like i tend to do i just go down rabbit holes and didn't have to go too far down the rabbit hole to, to learn that CBT was based on a other type of therapy, what I think was called REBT or something like that. And then that was mm -hmm. in itself taking the essence of, of stoicism. Can you talk to us about the relationship between CBT and stoicism? REBT is kind of the precursor or the first major form of CBT, depending how you look at it. It was founded in the mid-1950s, early 1950s by a New York psychotherapist called Albert Ellis. And Ellis had been a psychoanalytic uh, therapist in, in this tradition uh, inspired by Freud. And like a lot of people in the 50s, he was becoming disillusioned with the psychoanalytic approach. And uh, Ellis did something that I always admire people for doing. He, rather than kind of shuffling around the deck chairs in the Titanic and tweaking things a bit, he decided to completely start again from scratch. So he kind of risked everything in a way. He went, I'm going to scrap this whole thing and start completely from the beginning. And so he thought, well, if I was going to invent a new form of psychotherapy, what would it look like? And he thought, the, he remembered reading Marcus Aurelius and Epictetus in his youth. I think when he was about 17, he'd read Marcus Aurelius. And uh, that seemed to him like an obvious basis for psychotherapy. In fact, the ancient Stoics had uh, a psychotherapy. And some modern classicists, when we first began doing our conferences and things like that, said, well, you guys are kind of projecting psychotherapy or reading psychotherapy into the Stoic texts. And I thought that shows a terrible, woeful ignorance of the, the history of the subject. 
um, because the this medical or therapeutic metaphor was always present. In ancient philosophy, it was very common. And the ancient Stoics actually wrote well-known books on psychological therapy, although they don't actually survive today. We know they existed, and we have other references to them. Um, so Ellis looked at the surviving Stoic texts, and you know it's natural that he would think this seems like a type of therapy because it originally was. And uh, so he developed rational motor behavior therapy. Now, psychotherapy was going through a revolution because of research on emotions in the field of psychology. And, and there's something that we call the cognitive revolution in psychotherapy that happened. So therapists do, and researchers developed what's called the cognitive theory of emotion, which says that our emotions are shaped fundamentally by underlying beliefs or cognitions. And that happens to be uh, essentially what the Stoics also believed 2,300 years ago. And Ellis wanted to teach this to his clients and his students, and he did it using a quote from Epictetus, which is in Caridian, the handbook, passage number five. It says, it's not things that upset us, but our opinions about them. That's a cognitive theory of emotion in a nutshell. Uh, another good way of explaining it is that in therapy, clients will say they're anxious, they're depressed, or they're angry. And the first session, they'll talk about how terrible that is, how it's ruining their relationships, how it's affecting uh, them at work, uh, how it's affecting their quality of life, and so on. And, uh, and then they'll reach a point in that first session where having given a lot of reasons why they should change the way that they feel, because it's having all sorts of terrible consequences for them, they'll say, I know it doesn't make sense. I know it's causing all this harm to me and other people in the long run, but I can't help it. it it's just how I feel. And Ellis would say something really interesting to them. He'd say, yes, but it's not just how you feel. It's also how you think. That's the cognitive theory of emotion in a nutshell. Because if we believe that our emotions are shaped by underlying beliefs, first of all, that raises our self-awareness because we can begin to try and clarify and identify what those underlying beliefs actually are. And they have a general structure as well, which I'll mention in a moment. And uh, then we can uh, question whether they're true or false or helpful or unhelpful or rational, or irrational, logical or illogical, whether there might be alternative, more realistic, more constructive ways of looking at the same situation. So many people's emotions contain unfounded assumptions about the future or about what other people's motives are, or they contain sweeping generalizations uh, about or uh, excessively strong value judgments about the situations that they face. And, and those can be questioned. So someone that's depressed might think, nobody likes me, everybody hates me. I think I'll go and eat worms. It's a kid's nursery rhyme. But uh, you get the idea. Nobody likes me. Everybody hates me. But do they? Is that actually true? Or is it, you know, a, an overgeneralization, right? It's not true. It's, it's probably false. Like, so we can begin. Quite, it's not just how you feel. It's also how you think. And if you question those thoughts, then the feelings that go with them would probably change as well. And so that opens up a whole toolbox, or armamentarium, as we like to say, of uh, techniques, cognitive techniques. And the Stoics knew that 2,300 years ago. So that's how... Stoicism influenced cognitive therapy. Both Ellis and later Aaron T. Beck, the, the other main pioneer of cognitive behavioral therapy, cite the Stoics as their main philosophical inspiration for that reason. And from that shared philosophical premise, they were uh, not only did Ellis take other concepts and techniques from the Stoics, but they were bound in any case to arrive at similar conclusions about what treatment would look like. Because if you believe that emotions are caused by underlying thoughts and beliefs, it's natural that you then want to use techniques to clarify those beliefs, question them, find alternative beliefs, compare them to other people's beliefs. And, you know, the, the type of therapy and techniques you'd come up with would probably have a lot of similarities, even though they're separated by a period of over 2000 years. Thank you very much for appreciating that. Really appreciate that. That was super, super insightful. Now, I think in this modern age, we're dealing with a new, I guess, I want to call it an emotion, but maybe it's not an emotion, maybe it's more of a state of mind. And that's just this distractedness. And I know mm -hmm. it's something I, I tend to to deal with on a daily basis. Well, how could CBT and, and stoicism help us stay focused in, in a world where everything is meant to distract us? Mm, oh gosh, there's actually several answers I can think of to that question. Um, first and most obviously, very recently in the field of psychotherapy over maybe the last 10 years or so, um, 
there's been increasing interest in our the way we focus attention, like just literally, directly. Um, I guess this relates to one of the foundational principles of Stoicism, which is to distinguish between things that we can control and things that we don't control. And in psychotherapy, that has very profound implications. And it, uh, conf the confusion between things that we control and things that we don't is fundamental to many mental health problems in many very specific ways. You know, I might not have time to go into just now, but there are many. With clients, there would be many examples of this. But one of them would be people kind of naturally assume that their focus of attention is automatic when they're anxious. I can't help it. I just constantly keep thinking about this or that. And actually, we have not complete voluntary control, but quite a lot of voluntary control over the way that we focus attention. I can give you one very simple example of that that's very clear. People who suffer from social anxiety disorder, also called social phobia, um, we know from psychological research on them, the, this is my specialism as a therapist, incidentally. The, the, there's a very, very high correlation between social anxiety and what we call self-focused attention. Um, so feeling that everyone's looking at you, that you're the center of attention and paying a lot of attention to you, your own face, your body, your breathing, paying a lot of attention to your own thoughts, you know, focusing excessively on yourself. And that might seem obvious, you know, people kind of describe that, but it's a very tight correlation. And we know that also if you train, you can train people who have social anxiety to focus more attention on the people to whom they're speaking. So if they were giving a wedding speech or speaking at a conference or whatever, they would focus more on the audience. And partly that's just because it's got to do with the way that they look. Um, someone who has social anxiety might stare at their hands or stare at the lectern and, and kind of avoid making eye contact or looking out at the audience. And, and so obviously they can lift their head up and, and voluntarily look out more and they can train themselves to, to concentrate more on the audience. They can trick themselves into doing it as well by counting how many people in the audience have blue eyes. For instance, you know, uh, I'll, I'll just looking at somebody in the audience and imagining that they're going to try and sketch their face afterwards you know, to force themselves into a situation where they have to pay more attention to the other people. And uh, we also know that many of the things that people do to try and cope with anxiety uh, backfire by increasing self-focused attention. So someone with social anxiety might try to breathe in a more relaxing way, which seems like a plausible technique, but often it, it's actually quite counterproductive. It, it does more harm than good, because if you think too much about your breathing, then you're focusing even more attention on yourself. Um, and um, uh, that's another way of avoiding focusing attention on the audience or the people to whom you're speaking, which would be the normal way to use your attention when you're speaking. So we can play people audio recordings that directly instruct them how to retrain their attention just by getting them to exercise it, um, focusing on several things at once, broadening the scope of their attention, uh, focusing it more on uh, certain stimuli in the environment and things like that. Um, so the Stoics, I think, uh, would uh, potentially give us advice that's a little bit like that. Um, but also, the Stoics want to say that we'll naturally, and they're right about this, that we'll naturally focus our attention on things that we think are really important. Um, if you believe that something's really important, your brain, like a pet dog or something like that, is, it, it, kind of like a, if you shine a, a laser or a torch, your cat will... will kind of run after the light and play with it. If you think something's really important, your brain will think, well, I better pay attention to it for him, right? And uh, the Stoics want us to reappraise our values so that we uh, realize that our own faculty of judgment is really important and our own character is really important. Uh, so that we begin to really focus more attention on, on our use of judgment. Um, and uh, also in being distracted by things on social media and stuff like that, um, often that's because the news media and social media are designed to hijack our emotions, hijack our amygdala by, you know, it's telling us shocking, like clickbait things like the news 
says very alarmist things that tries to frighten us, make us angry and so on. And that the Stoics would encourage us to avoid allowing our emotions to be hijacked by questioning these things, by broadening our perspective on them so that they are uh, less uh, emotionally evocative. In the same way that Socrates and the, so- the Stoics thought that the sophists manipulated people's emotions, the Facebook and Twitter and uh, CNN and Fox are the modern day digital sophists. And, uh, you know, Stoicism and uh, Socratic philosophy are designed to counteract the, the use of rhetoric, propaganda, um, emotional, uh, you know, sh- tactics that uh, the, the media use in the same way that the, the sophists used to use them to manipulate crowds in ancient Athens and ancient Rome. So the Stoics have many, many techniques to, to help them uh, remain aloof from, from those kind of rhetorical strategies. Thank you very much uh, for sharing that. Yeah, I guess this focus is, is something that I guess even Marcus Aurelius was dealing with because there are several pas- passages in meditation where he says, you know, concentrate every minute on doing what's in front yeah. of you. Um, so I guess a lot of this stuff is, it's new, but it's the same because it's still human nature and we haven't changed much, have we? He says something very interesting about it. It's one of the major themes of the meditations that he keeps coming back to is this idea that he should uh, concentrate his attention on the fundamental goal of life. So in a way, it, it seems like an obvious thing. He says, what should I be concentrating on? What should I be focusing on? He thinks everything I do, every thought that goes through my mind, I should ask myself, uh, does this actually help me to get closer to you, Daimonea, or does it move me in the opposite direction? And he thinks we're all over the place normally, and that we should ask ourselves, what is the fundamental goal in life? What's the most important thing for Stoics? It's eudaimonia, arity, moral wisdom, enlightenment of a sort, moral enlightenment. Uh, And Marcus thinks, if you believe that that's the number one thing, the most important thing in life, if it's the meaning of life, if it's the telos, it's what everything is about, you have to ask yourself, are you actually right now doing anything to get closer to that? Or are you, you know, just distracting yourself from it um, by going on Facebook or watching reality TV or other stuff? You know, have you, have you gone off the track and, and wandered off uh, in the opposite direction? And this is a constant theme. He's always trying to drag himself back uh, towards the, the true goal, the fundamental goal in life. And speaking of wisdom and, and virtues and excellence of character, I'd like to dig into some of these concepts um, to kind of clarify these for the audience here. So talk to us about this stoic concept of practical wisdom. Mm-hmm. So the Stoic definition of wisdom is uh, really simple. You know, I, one of the things that benefits me most, I think, apart from in therapy, you know, the job of a therapist in a sense is like a, the job of a translator. So therapists have to read scientific research, which is kind of pretty dry and abstract and technical. And then you have to sit down in front of 15-year-old kids or old ladies or you know, people who don't speak English as their first language or postmen or whoever, a random mixture of people may come into a consulting room. And you have to take the psychological research that you've been reading and translate it into terms that the person in front of you can relate to and, and understand. Um, and I find uh, that helpful. And I've also found it helpful having a, a nine-year-old daughter and uh, ask me about philosophy and history and stuff, trying to kind of explain things to her. So... I, first of all, I, I would say to my daughter, do you know what the word wisdom means? And she would say, well, I'm not really sure, Daddy. And I said, you know, I think in, in a way the, the most important thing is just to use that word sometimes to kind of think about it and, and ask ourselves, even like a very, you know, a tiny baby step. Like Socrates said, the unexamined life is not worth living and, and that we should constantly be asking ourselves what wisdom means. But even if we just begin to wonder about it a little bit, it's a magical word. It's different from knowledge or cleverness or intelligence. And it's a word that we don't really talk about that much today. But just asking in casual conversation, what makes somebody wise rather than smart, or clever, or shrewd? Like, it's an interesting conversation. It's the type of conversation that Socrates thought we should be having. Now, I, if I was talking to my daughter about it, uh, I'd say, I think maybe um, wisdom is understanding which things are genuinely important in life. 
and, and, and which things aren't really important in life. And that maybe that's different from the sort of things that the majority of people spend their time pursuing. You know, maybe wisdom consists in being able to look at what other people think is important and realizing that it isn't. And, and realizing that things that other people seem to be ignoring are, are actually much more important. And that, that shift in our values changes our emotions, our behavior, our whole quality of life, potentially. That's what the Stoics meant by moral wisdom. The Stoics actually gives a formal definition of wisdom. And they say it's uh, the knowledge of uh, good, bad, and indifferent things, which is just a slightly more convoluted way of saying, you know, understanding what's important and what isn't important in life. And for the Stoics, it would be really fundamentally grasping that the only truly good thing is arity or, or virtue and that health, wealth, reputation and things like that are relatively indifferent. Um, those things are only as valuable as the use that we make of them ultimately. And uh, so it's, uh, that's how I would define uh, wisdom. But more fundamentally, I think that asking ourselves to define wisdom is, is really the starting point. It's the beginning of philosophy. And can you walk us through these cardinal virtues of mm -hmm. Stoicism? What was the, first of all, I guess, unpacking that word cardinal, like why where cardinal? Where does that come from? Yeah, where does that come from? And are there other virtues that, that we should consider? If I remember rightly, it's a Latin, a term of Latin origin that wasn't used uh, in ancient philosophy, but it was introduced by uh, medieval Christian authors who assimilated the, the four virtues. It's a very famous model. It, it became popular in the Renaissance. It's popular in the Middle Ages. Um, and the Stoics seem to really embrace it, but it's older than the Stoics, and you know, there's traces of it in Plato's writings. It seems that maybe Socrates was familiar with it, but nobody really knows where this fourfold distinction came from. And the, the expression cardinal, um, if I remember rightly, it, in Latin, it refers to a hinge, like on a, a door. And so the, the, the idea is that it's fun, they're fundamental, they're the, the hinges like, uh, on which uh, a door is balanced. Um, and for some reason, the ancient Greeks, often but not always, uh, over time increasingly they embraced this uh, fourfold model. And, and Plato is a little bit uh, more ambig ambivalent about it. Sometimes he talks about it in, in, that, in those terms and sometimes he's... He's got a slightly broader conception of virtue. But the four virtues are um, wisdom, justice, courage, and temperance. So you can translate them in different ways. The translation is a little bit problematic in some ways. So wisdom is generally the most important, most fundamental one. It kind of encompasses the other virtues. Uh, justice is trickiest one maybe to translate, second trickiest one to translate. Uh, the word is dikaiosune in Greek, and it, uh, sometimes it used to be translated righteousness as well. Some scholars might even say it kind of just means moral virtue. I would say social virtue might be a way of translating it. It's broader than our concept of justice. Justice to us sounds kind of legalistic, but dikaiosune is a virtue that a mother might exhibit towards her children. Would we call that justice? Like it's uh, interpersonal virtue. Virtue in terms of the way you relate to individuals or the way you relate to society as a whole. Very simple. And, and that, that makes the structure obvious. So wisdom is the fundamental virtue of understanding the value of things. And then justice consists in putting that understanding into practice in terms of how you relate to society and, and your family and your friends and other individuals. It's the social or interpersonal application of moral wisdom. Um, and the, the Stoics tell us that the Kaiosune consists of two main elements, fairness and uh, beneficence or, or kindness. So trying to treat others fairly and equally, but also trying to help them and do them good. You know, again, that goes a little bit beyond what we, we might think of by the word justice today. So maybe social virtue would be a better term. And then the, the other two terms, so in ancient writings, wisdom and justice are kind of often seen as the two most important. There's a passage in Marcus Aurelius where he actually says that justice is the most important virtue, interestingly. So usually it's wisdom and then justice is almost as important or advised with it because it's a social dimension. And then the other two virtues, courage and temperance, on a slightly different level, they relate to our passions. Uh, so courage is a virtue that we require in order to overcome uh, the passion or the emotion of fear and to master that. And uh, 
temperance is the virtue that allows us to master our desires. And desires are another form of passion. The word passion in Greek philosophy includes what we call emotions and desires. So temperance allows us to master our excessive or irrational desires, our cravings, our unhealthy desires. It's also sometimes translated as moderation. Um, the, the Greek word is sophrosune. It's actually a, the, probably the hardest one to translate. It almost in Greek means something, uh, it implies something almost a bit like mindfulness or being self-possessed, um, having moderation, controlling your desires, but, but also being very aware of your habits and cravings and, and desires. And uh, courage is probably the, the, the simpler one. But the Greek term uh, for courage, Andrea, um, also kind of implies endurance, like enduring tiredness or fatigue would kind of fall under that, that heading as well. So in Epictetus allegedly had a slogan, you may have heard of this, there's an ancient author that says one of Epictetus's favorite sayings was endure and renounce. And that obviously, although he doesn't say so, that clearly that seems to correlate with those two virtues of self-mastery to uh, endure as the virtue of courage. Um, it allows us to put up with pain and to face the things uh, of which we're uh, emotionally frightened and we endure frightening things. We endure uncomfortable or painful things through the virtue of courage, Andrea, or endurance. And to renounce things is the virtue of moderation, sophrosune, or temperance. We renounce our excessive, unhealthy, or harmful desires and, and cravings. And uh, I, very simply, I would say the way they all fit together is wisdom is the core. Justice, or the kaiosune, is wisdom applied to our interpersonal relationships. And because we have fears and desires, in order to live in accord with wisdom and justice, we require those other two virtues uh, to master our fears and desires so that we can live consistently in accord with wisdom and justice. Otherwise, fear and uh, cravings would, would, would lead us astray and prevent us from being able to, to live justly. So the way I kind of conceptualize it, let me know if I'm conceptualizing this incorrectly. It's like if we were to have two poles and mm -hmm. on one end would be uh, the, the virtues and then would the other end, like the opposite of the virtues be passions? Is that the correct way to think about that? Yeah, I think so. Basically, I mean, normally we'd say the vices are the opposite, but the passions are essentially very closely related to the, the vices. And I should say a little bit of stoic psychology. Um, it's just a quirk of the Greek language, I think, or perhaps particularly in the Stoic writings, that the word passion used in an unqualified way really is used to refer to irrational, excessive, unhealthy passions, how the Stoics describe them in terms of three qualities. Um, but they, they, it's confusing because um, when they refer to passion, emotions and desires, and they're generally thinking of the unhealthy ones, but they also distinguish those from healthy, rational, proportionate desires, the eupathei. Um, so they also qualify passions, but there are also good passions, healthy passions, May, like love, joy. There's even healthy forms of shame, the Stoics think, which would be like what we would think of as having a conscience, like there's healthy aversion, like being averse to corruption, uh, having an aversion to, to doing things that are dishonest. I, uh, Epictetus talks about that quite a lot. And uh, there are also, uh, the Stoic theory of emotion is, is actually very nuanced. Um, the Stoics also acknowledge that there are involuntary emotions. Uh, they call them proto-passions. Seneca calls them first movements. In Greek, uh, they're called the propathei. And uh, you could say that the emotions are grouped into good, bad, and indifferent ones. So generally, it sounds like the Stoics are mainly talking as if all emotions are bad, but they're not. They, they think they're also good emotions that we should be trying to cultivate. And they're also indifferent emotions or, you know, the precursors of emotion, which we should definitely not view as bad. Um, Epictetus says we should view them as natural and inevitable. So if he, he gives a, there's a famous example, actually, in another author called Aulus Gellius. It's a bit convoluted because he tells a story about having met an unnamed Stoic teacher who was caught in a boat during a storm at sea and then takes out a copy of Epictetus's discourses and tells him about it and reads him a part of it. It's a slightly convoluted story. 
But uh, the upshot of, of it is Gellius says to this guy, you're a famous Stoic teacher. And we can have lots of historical fun trying to guess who the guy is that he's talking about, by the way. But he, he says to this guy, you're a famous Stoic teacher from Athens. And I noticed during the storm, everyone was freaking out. And you weren't screaming or, or crying out uh, or praying to the gods, but you, you turned pale and you were shaking because they all really thought they were going to die in this boat. He said, but you, you looked scared as well. Um, and, he's, and the guy said, well, the Epictetus and the Stoic teachers say that there are these involuntary emotions. And even a, an experienced uh, sailor during a storm like that would naturally feel afraid um, and those are involuntary, so we should accept them, view them with indifference. If we thought they were bad, we'd be ashamed of them. We'd try to repress them or conceal them or battle against them. And the Stoics think that would be like trying to control something that's beyond your direct control. Like, instead, you should just shrug them off, like, uh, even like, welcome them with indifference. They're neither here nor there. They're, they shouldn't be viewed as bad or shameful. Um, they're just things that happen to you. And... Uh, he said, what matters is how we respond to them, what, what we do next. And uh, so rather than complaining or screaming or running around going woo, 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 um, or dwelling on them afterwards, uh, the, the Stoic philosopher just shrugged and, and moved on, uh, whereas other people were still fretting about them. Um, so we have these involuntary initial emotions, and then what we have control over is how we, we then respond to them. And, and this, to me, is incredible because this is very similar to a, a contemporary cognitive, three-stage cognitive model of emotion proposed by Aaron T. Beck, the founder of cognitive therapy. So the Stoics have a far more nuanced and state-of-the-art cognitive model of emotion than, than most people assume. And it's a shame that more people don't appreciate that because really, uh, you know, not understanding that leads to a lot of widespread misconceptions about what the Stoics are saying. Like some, a lot of people think the Stoics want us to kind of try and repress all our emotions and stuff, whereas actually you could argue that they, they, they want us to shrug off and, and accept and to stop fighting against uh, some of aspects of our anxiety, the involuntary aspects of our anxiety. And they want us to do something that we would do a lot in modern therapy, which is to get people to become clearer about which aspects of anxiety or depression are involuntary and which aspects are, are actually under the voluntary control. Most people spend too much time being ashamed of or struggling against the involuntary or automatic aspects of mental health problems, and they, they neglect to take responsibility for, ownership of, control over things that they could potentially control. Uh, for instance, uh, when someone's anxious, their heart starts beating really fast, their hands start sweating, they can't control that. It's a physiological response. Epictetus would say that it's neither here nor there, it's just a natural process. You should view it with indifference rather than viewing it as a bad thing. But you do have control over how much time you choose to spend worrying about it. Um, you know, you can sit for hours dwelling on and ruminating about it. Um, and that's something that people tend not to take control over. They just allow it to run amok. Whereas uh, modern psychotherapists would say, you, you know, you can just stop thinking about it. Like that, 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 those are voluntary thought processes. Like you could just go off into something else. And in, in fact, we have to do that if we want to go to sleep. We do that every night when we have intrusive thoughts that come into our mind. So we think, I've got to get to sleep now. I have to get up for work tomorrow. And we, we go over and say, I'll, I'll, I'll think about this tomorrow. Right? So it's, it's perfectly natural to cease voluntary engagement with, with intrusive thoughts. But people who have severe mental health problems find it difficult to do that, but they can learn how to do that. Speaking of misconceptions about Stoics and, and Stoicism, I think Stoicism gets a bad rap. People may think that those who practice Stoicism are cold or unemotional, but that's not really true, is it? I love this question. It's the most common misconception of Stoicism. In the ancient world, people thought that as well, and the Stoics uh, seem to be fairly experienced at refuting that. So there's a recurring kind of figure of speech in the ancient Stoic writings. It's in the early Greek fragments. I think it's in Cicero. It's in Epictetus. Uh, I think it's in Seneca as well. So there's a familiar phrase that they use. They say the wise man doesn't have a heart of stone or iron. Um, he's not like a statue. So they say he's not the wise man. The Stoic ideal isn't to be unemotional. In fact, on the contrary, the, the Stoic ideal, Marcus Aurelius describes at the beginning of the book of uh, the Meditations, book one, 
uh, he's talking about one of his Stoic teachers, Sextus of Chironea, and Marcus says he was free from passion, and by which he means the irrational, excessive, unhealthy passions, and yet full of love. And the word he uses is philostorgia. So there's a problem with translation there. So clearly, you can't say free of passion and yet full of love and be using the word passion to include love, right? So it's, it's obvious from that that he means bad, unhealthy passions, right? And uh, the word that he uses for love um, is a very specific stoic technical term that uh, would probably, it's translated as natural affection or familial affection. It's the kind of love that parents would have for their children or we could, the phrase that we might use today is brotherly love, platonic love. Like, so he's, he's full of this kind of philosophical, paternal, brotherly uh, love or affection towards his fellow man. Um, so it's, it's strange that people think of Stoics as being like Mr. Spock or like robots or whatever. And in fact, what they're saying is that their ideal is to be full of this kind of pure uh, love towards our, our, our fellow men and women. That's, that's their ideal. Um, a little hint of that comes from Zeno's Republic, which is perhaps the founding text of Stoicism, although it's lost to us now. One of the things we know about it is that Zeno described this utopian Stoic society, and the patron god of that society was Eros, the god of love. And uh, you know, there are many references scattered throughout the Stoic literature to this idea that the, the goal is to experience a particular type of rational love towards our fellow men. And also, I think the Stoics want us to cultivate a, a sort of rational self-love as well. I really believe that's quite fundamental to, to Stoicism. Um, and the, our, this idea of what we call justice, it's a shame because like I mentioned earlier, that's quite a cold legalistic term. Um, the, the social virtue, the Kayasune, is all about love. Uh, that's a, a healthy passion that, that goes along with it. By the time this episode releases, it'll be <laughs> U.S. Thanksgiving will be kicking off the holiday season. So I think talking about this concept of natural affection, I think is going to be great for the season that we're going to be heading into here. Uh -huh. So talk to us about the Stoics psychological practice for expanding and cultivating this natural affection and friendship towards the rest of mankind. Well, we, you mentioned, I think earlier, this fragment from about the circles of Hierocles, um, which is really cool, a little strange little concept. And so the Stoics probably have other techniques like this. Hierocles says that we should imagine that like the, the layers of an onion almost, we have these concentric relationships. So we have a relationship with ourself, like we have self-love, uh, and with our spouse, and with our family, and with our friends, and with our society, our town, our nation, like the whole human race, um, and these kind of expanding circles. And he thinks what we should aim to do is to psychologically bring people that are in each of the circles one step closer. Um, so we treat our fellow countrymen as if they were members of our family. We treat our cousins as if they were brothers and so on and so forth. And he actually, as well as he implies that we should visualize things this way. He doesn't quite frame it in those terms, but we can make that a visualization exercise. He says we should think about it that way. But he, he actually also mentions using a kind of quaint little verbal technique. He says we should call um, our friend's brother, like, and we should call uh, acquaintances, his friends, and, and so on. And you can uh, see perhaps hints of that in the meditations. Uh, so Marcus talks about uh, viewing strangers as his kinsmen, uh, and he, like he referring to them as brothers. And uh, in the way that members of a monastic order perhaps might refer to others as brothers and so on. Right. But in the throughout the meditations, Marcus talks about viewing people in general as his kin, uh, his brothers, sisters. Um, so doing something a bit like this verbal technique that we find in Hierocles. Uh, and also in the histories, we get some corroboration of this, but it's kind of the other way around. We were told that Marcus's friends and acquaintances, would, uh, his teachers would call him their son, and uh, uh, people would, uh, you know, refer to him and uh, using these slightly more intimate uh, terms. We say, people. Somebody said this to me the other day. Uh, I saw on Facebook. Someone was saying, "Oh, Marcus seems like a, they say he was like a cold character, a doer character in the meditations." Um, he's not at all like that. And we have his private correspondence. 
And also in the histories, we're told that he was very kind of gregarious. He was serious, but very friendly and affectionate. In his private letters, he's gushing with affection. And so when we talk about Faustorgia, like I, if you want to kind of see that in Marcus, you read his letters to Fronto, there's not a lot of philosophy in them. In the 19th century, a cache of letters were found that, that were uh, belonged to Marcus Cornelius Fronto, his rhetoric teacher. It's a sophist and uh, a close family friend. And most of them are between Fronto and Marcus Aurelius, but some of them are to other people that they knew, like Marcus's adopted brother, Lucius Ferris. And it's clear that he's an incredibly loving and affectionate guy. The other thing that emerges from those letters, just as a little bit of trivia, um, is that you, we can clearly see, it's like having a window into his real personal life you know, because they were never meant for publication. So we see what he was actually like when he was talking to people that he knew intimately. And he, the one thing that's crystal clear is he clearly, Marcus, clearly demonstrates that he's uh, very tactful and adept at reconciling arguments between his friends and that he clearly is somebody who's cut out for a career as a kind of diplomat which is partly what his, his role became as, as emperor and, and to some extent prior to that. He often had to negotiate peace treaties with enemy tribes and things. And he must have been really good at it. Because judging by the letters, he's a very observant, tactful, sensitive, highly articulate man and, and very good at, at resolving disputes between people. We can see him in action doing that. And I, I think it's 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 fairly impressive. Uh, he's not just talking about doing it; we can see him doing it. Um, and then that's part of his loving and affectionate nature. He wants his friends to get along with one another, and he wants uh, them to bury the hatchet and stuff. Yeah, this natural affection, I think, it manifests itself in relationships we have throughout life: mentors, mentees, teachers, teammates at work, at home, in our family life, and as members of a larger community. I love what you say in your book that to become a stoic is to learn what it means to have natural affection for our friends and family in accord with the wisdom and virtue. And Seneca says in Epistles 52 on choosing our teachers that we should choose as a guide one whom you will admire more when you see him act than when you hear him speak. So what better guide to choose than the man whose philosophy you write about and how to think like a Roman emperor, Marcus Aurelius. So building on the, the circles of, of Hierocles, let's start at the, the, the center here. What can Marcus teach us about improving our relationship with ourselves? I think that's a very important question. It's a very profound question. It's sometimes not explicitly stated uh, in the Stoic literature, but it's implied uh, in many, many passages. For instance, in On Anger, when Seneca's talking about his nighttime review and the, Pyth the Golden Verses of Pythagoras, he talks about um, actually doing something that he seems to be comparing to the, or it sounds like, the Socratic Alenchus. He says he, he interrogates himself like a witness in court, which is what the Socratic method is, is usually described as being like. And, uh, but he also says he does it in a friendly way. Uh, he treats himself like a, a friend rather than doing it in a kind of aggressive, like dictatorial sort of way. I think there's a paradox about the very nature of love, which is I think often people vacillate between two different types of love. And one involves accepting other people, like loving them as they are, um, and, you know, for, for who they are, like what's and all, as they say. And then the other one, and the other aspect of love is, is wanting someone to achieve their potential and to, to flourish. And I mean, we think when we talk about love, about romantic relationships and stuff, there are many forms of love. And, and actually, I think it's easier, uh, the best template for love generally, I think many wise men and women agree is, to, is parental love. If you think about your relationship with your own children, you know, it's easier to understand this tension between accepting them for who they are, but also wanting them to grow into something better and to, to, to achieve their potential. And so, you know, if you really, really want your kids to flourish and to become wiser and stronger and more courageous, you've got to be careful that that doesn't lead you to despise who they are or if they fall short of that standard to get frustrated with them. 
Yeah. So love can easily turn into hate if we're not careful. Like, you know, life's difficult. Like our emotions are complex. You know, sometimes because when we, we love someone a, a lot, we end up getting angry with them if we're not careful. And uh, also loving someone for who they are, like we have to be careful that doesn't become too passive. Like, and we, we underestimate their potential. Like, we don't see who they could be. Um, sometimes love also has to be tough. Like, you know, if we really love someone, we, we, we want, might want them to, to grow stronger, more independent, to liberate them, you know, rather than being stuck like, where they are and stagnating, as it were. So there, there has to be some kind of, somehow we have to juggle these, these two seemingly contradictory things. And I think the Stoics have an answer to that. They, it's uh, related to well, their fundamental idea about there being two different types of value and then also it runs through their philosophy. So we find it very clearly in their concept of the reserve clause. So the, the Stoics think that uh, we should want things that are outside of our direct control uh, to turn out in a way that it's rational to prefer. So other people are a good example of something that's beyond our direct control. So we should want our kids to become wise and virtuous. Like it's it's perfectly reasonable like to do that. Certainly, you know, it wouldn't be very reasonable to want our kids to become foolish and vicious, right? So, it, it, you know, of course the Stoics prefer that their children become wise and, and virtuous and flourish as, as human beings. Um, but simultaneously, we, we, do, we, we, wish, we will that, simultaneously accepting that it's not under our direct control and uh, emotionally accepting the possibility that the opposite might happen. Um, and so the Stoics want us to have this kind of philosophical attitude towards our relationship where we, it's kind of like that phrase, hope for the best, but prepare for the worst. Like where we, we want the best from other people, but we want it in a sense lightly and with a certain kind of philosophical detachment. So we go into desiring uh, a certain outcome, but simultaneously knowing that it's uh, it's not entirely under con un control and it's partly in the hands of fate. Also, like um, Senate Cicero uses this metaphor of a spearman or an archer, and he says that he can uh, aim the, the arrow at a target. So we would aim at the target of having our, our kids flourish, might be wise and virtuous, right? while simultaneously accepting that the, the target might uh, move or a gust of wind might blow the arrow, of course. Uh, he doesn't get all upset, uh, freak out if he misses the target. He just does his best and uh, uh, accepts the, the outcome with equanimity. Um, and so this is a cliche in ancient philosophy was that even the wisest teacher has wayward students, but it doesn't stop him from trying. So Socrates famously had a couple of really obnoxious students, uh, Critias and uh, Alcibiades. And also Socrates' three sons were supposedly dullards and you know, not very admirable people. So people would say, look, even Socrates had bad children and, and students that didn't turn out that well. But it didn't stop him from trying his best to, to be a, a wise and virtuous teacher. And that's his way of expressing love. Yeah. Um, I'm curious how this works if, if it goes the other way. We talk about a parent towards their children, but what if a child wishes to see more virtuous characteristics in their parents, but their parents seem to be set in their ways and not flourishing and not growing. How, how, would, that, how would that work out? I think it's a similar kind of relationship. Like the other thing the Stoics would say, um, this may be a good starting point in any of these sort of discussions, is that we, maybe, we perhaps go into it, like often the case that Socrates would say, we, we go into these discussions often back to front. So, we should be thinking more um, rather than changing, trying to change or reform other people directly by exerting influence over them. We should think more in terms of setting an example through our own character, right? and that should be our, our priority. So a Stoic would say, yeah, I, I'd like my parents or my children to be wiser and more virtuous, but first and foremost, I need to exhibit those qualities myself. I, and hope that they'll learn from my example. And then maybe second to that, I might consider how I interact with them in terms of stuff I say to them or ways that I try to influence them. Uh, but before I try to lecture somebody, uh, I should first pause and, and ask myself whether, whether I'm actually embodying 
the, the qualities that I'd, that I'd like them to develop. Otherwise, I'm just going to make myself into a hypocrite. If I give someone into trouble and I start lecturing them on how they want to behave, you know, I should always pause and, and, and think whether I could be doing more of myself to actually embody those qualities. I, I found it very interesting in, in meditations that he dedicates an entire, like the, the opening first, like 10% of the book almost, it's uh, debts and lessons. So mm. who, who are some of the teachers and mentors that Marcus talks about? Um, and what role did these teachers and mentors play in his life? I like your statistic. It's probably about 10% of the book. There are 17 people, I think he mentions, and they're all either family members or teachers. Um, so the first person he mentions is his grandfather, and he says about him that he had a noble character and he was free from anger. I think that's interesting because Marcus late then says that he had problems with controlling his own anger. And uh, throughout the meditations, anger is the emotion that he refers to most often. So sneakily, uh, people often struggle to try and dig out some sort of structure to the meditations. And it's really kind of diverse and unstructured. But anger is certainly a theme in it, and it's the, the, one of the first qualities he mentions in the opening sentence. Um, and the other people are the other interesting things are a couple of years i'll give you some trivia actually for this is maybe a bit nerdy but for people anyone that's read the meditations here's things you might not have thought about like uh it's odd that he mentions uh, an unnamed slave who was his childhood tutor when he was a small child and he doesn't mention herodes atticus who i'm in athens at the moment there are a number of buildings here that still stand uh like the odeon of herodes atticus and the side of the Acropolis. He was a world-famous sophist and orator. He was a billionaire philanthropist. And he was a family friend of Marcus Aurelius, and he was his Greek uh, rhetoric tutor. And the Meditations is written in Greek, the language that Herodes Atticus uh, trained Marcus in. Marcus never mentions having, uh, he doesn't have anything positive to say about him. Uh, he was a notoriously horrible man. He, he was put on trial for kicking his pregnant wife to death. Uh, yeah, he was a horrible guy. But he, he, got, all, he got off with that. But, uh, you know, he, he did a, a number of other atrocious things. He had a bad temper. So Marcus doesn't mention people like that. He's a world-famous uh, orator. Um, and who does he... But instead, he mentions a guy who, whose name he can't even remember, uh, who, who was like a, a, a mentor to him when he, he was a small boy. And he says, this guy taught me not to listen to slander. He taught me to to be willing to undertake hard work. He taught me, you know, I, and, and this is, uh, Marcus is writing this um, three or four decades later after he'd known this guy. Like, it's no wonder he can't remember his name. Uh, and, uh, yeah, he's probably a slave or a freedman in, the, in the, his mother's household. So that's really interesting um, that uh, he places more importance on what this guy taught him than on some of the most famous teachers in the empire um, who has, had been paid to, to teach him virtue and, and uh, culture as a youth. And the other strange thing for a Roman is uh, the amount of importance he puts on uh, having learned virtue from his mother. So the, uh, we have a couple of lectures from... Masonius Rufus, the teacher of Epictetus, about the Stoic idea that virtue is the same in men and women, and uh, that, that women should learn philosophy the same as boys. Uh, women didn't normally learn philosophy in Greece and Rome. In ancient Greece, philosophy was typically, but not always, taught in the gymnasia, which are kind of sports grounds. Women weren't allowed anywhere near them. They weren't even allowed in the front door. Um, there's a story that a couple of women attended one of Plato's lectures, but they had to do so disguised as men. Whereas uh, the Stoics seem to have embraced uh, teaching women uh, philosophy and, and believed that, that, you know, ancient Athenians didn't really think that women could have uh, virtue. In fact, the, the word for courage that we mentioned earlier, Andrea, literally means manliness. So it would have been a contradiction then to them to, to, to think that women could even possess the, the virtue of, of courage or manliness. Um, and, and being womanish is a very common insult. Uh, even Marcus even uses it himself sometimes. It's a pervasive insult that the, the ancient authors wouldn't ever really have thought twice about. Uh, it's just to say someone is womanish is to say that they're weak and foolish. Um, such so sexist was the, the ancient society. Despite all of that, Oh, and I should say also, we, we don't know a great deal about what the early Stoics said about this, but we know that we have a number of intriguing book titles 
from we, we get a long list of book titles uh, from early Stoics, and sometimes the titles are revealing. So there's a book by Cleanthes, the second head of the Stoa, called That Virtue is the Same in Men and Women, which clearly seems to preempt these lectures by Masonius Rufus, which are written centuries later. So I don't think this is something Masonius Rufus has come up with. I think he's referring to a, 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 an idea that goes back to the perhaps the very origins of, of Stoicism. I think perhaps even to Socrates really ultimately drives home. But Marcus embodies that belief that virtue is the same in men and women, because when he's going through his role models, one of them is his mum, and that's quite striking. Right. So in a culture that thinks to be womanish means being weak and servile and foolish, Marcus thinks his mum uh, taught him more about manliness and virtue, courage and integrity than some of the most highly acclaimed philosophers and teachers in the empire um, who were his tutors in his youth. So he, he, he's embodying this idea that virtue is the same in men and women, that he could learn about virtue from a woman like his mother. Um, I'm even suspicious that it may have been his mother that introduced Marcus to Stoicism. There's a little tiny hint that Marcus's mother, um, well, we know that Marcus's mother knew Junius Rusticus, who is his main Stoic mentor, because Marcus says in passing that Rusticus wrote a, a, a very powerful letter to his mother. So I wonder whether his mother knew Rusticus before he became Marcus's teacher. And then she said, this guy's my friend. He's a great Stoic philosopher. He should be the, the tutor to my son. And she was a, we know she was a highly cultured woman and very interested in, in great literature. You know the phrase behind every man, great man is a great woman? Like Marcus makes it pretty clear like, that his mum, because his dad died when he was a small child, and it was, his mum had a more prominent role in his upbringing than, uh, than, than would be typical perhaps for a Roman noble. And then... So that's quite striking. The other striking thing is that the guy, that, another guy that he doesn't mention. So Marcus talks at great length about Antonius Pius. That's the person he says most about, Antoninus Pius. He's an adoptive father um, and the preceding emperor. And clearly Marcus thinks that's his main role model. It's, so it's not a Stoic. It's uh, a guy who was interested in philosophy, but wasn't really, as far as we know, committed to a school of philosophy. But Marcus thinks he seems to embody more of the virtues he wants to learn than, than anyone else. He, he's crystal clear that he views himself, he says he views himself as a disciple of Antoninus Pius. He's his template for what it means to be a good emperor. And, uh, and he says a great deal about him. But he says nothing about Hadrian his adoptive grandfather, the emperor that preceded Antoninus, although Marcus knew Hadrian when he was a child, and it was Hadrian that selected Marcus to be a future emperor. And almost everything Marcus says about Antoninus Pius, you can put in brackets after it, the opposite of Hadrian. It, it seems like it's an implicit criticism. For, for Romans, by the way, to miss someone out and ignore them was, was considered a very damning thing. You know, it was one of the worst things you could do some, to someone is to damn their memory and kind of strike out their name and never mention them again. Marcus it seems almost like he's doing that to Hadrian. Um, he, he says of Antoninus Pius, no one would ever call him a sophist. Well, everyone called Hadrian a sophist. But Hadrian was at the very center of the second sophistic. He surrounded himself with sophists. Um, so it really sounds like he's, he's having a pop at Hadrian uh, indirectly by uh, the things he says in praise of Antoninus Pius. And in his mind, perhaps, I'm speculating, Hadrian embodied what it means to be a really bad emperor, a corrupt emperor, and Antoninus Pius is the polar opposite. And Marcus perhaps didn't want to be Caesar, to be a future emperor, because he thought, I don't want to end up like Hadrian. He was hated by the Senate. Um, when he died, he, he turned into a paranoid uh, megalomaniac uh, dictator with spies everywhere, uh, having purges and murdering his, his rivals. Um, and then Antoninus luckily intervened as the, uh, a kind of interim ruler for uh, quite a long period of time. And I think that convinced Marcus. Marcus looked at Antoninus Pius and thought, well, hang on a minute, this guy's proving to me that it's possible to be a Roman emperor and be uncorrupted by power. Like, otherwise, I wouldn't have believed it was possible for, for me to become emperor. I would have ended worried that I might have ended up like Hadrian. So th those are some of the things I think that are going on in that part of the book. There's some interesting kind of subtexts, potentially. And he praises his Stoic teachers. He also praises his Aristotelian teacher and Platonist teachers, which is kind of interesting. 
Um, and, you know, it's, it's it's interesting also, like I say, to notice he doesn't mention Hadrian or Herodes Atticus or, or, or several other people that we would have imagined. He mentions his adoptive brother, Lucius Verus, um, in fleetingly, like a footnote. And he says um, he was grateful for his loyalty and affection. I think that's damning him with faint praise, right? And I think if we, maybe this is speculation on my part, but I think that implies that Marcus had concerns about his loyalty my, and that uh, he his praising his loyalty is like which kind of in brackets which kind of surprised me. Why I, I I would have thought like maybe he would have posed a a, a threat as a rival to the throne. Yeah, um, was, but he didn't in the end. It was interesting, like how he said about his brother to have the kind of brother I did, one whose character challenged me to improve my own. And when that's I re- very ambiguous, isn't it? Yeah. Well, when I read when I read it the first time, when I heard it, I was like, "Oh, he must have had a really awesome brother." Then I read your book, and I was like, oh, "Wait, his brother was kind of a dick." Yeah, and you know, it's it's ambiguous. Like, so you know, my my, my brother challenged me to improve my own character because your brother was a raging alcoholic and a playboy, and <laughs> you you inspired you to be the opposite. Like, you know, it's a it's we don't know for sure. So many historians believe that the Historia Augusta trashes. Lucius Verus for a couple of political reasons or because it makes for a better story. So I read there's a good biography of Lucius Verus actually that, that argues that he wasn't as bad as the, the histories make him out to be. But I, actually, I, I, they may exaggerate things, but I, I think there's probably a lot of truth in what they say. And I think Lucius Verus probably was quite, a, um, quite different from Marcus and maybe a bad emperor in, in some ways. Maybe also, you know, one ever puts it like this, but maybe in some ways a kind of prototype of co- what Commodus later became. Mm-hmm. Um, there, there are, if you're a Roman emperor, there are a number of ways. You, so first of all, being a Roman emperor kind of sucks, right? Believe it or not, because uh, a lot of them were assassinated. <laughs> it's, a, it's, it's quite a stressful job. It's like the sort of Damocles hanging over your head all the time. And, I, and it's understandable that a lot of people didn't really want to become Roman emperor. Um, and so there, you, how do you hang on to power? How do you survive as Roman emperor? Th- there are kind of three main things I think that you need to p- potentially juggle. So one is if the legions are on your side. And so first and foremost, the Roman emperor is the commander in chief of the Roman legions. And that's, that's really, in a sense, traditionally, that's meant to be where his authority comes from. It's actually technically the legions that acclaim him or appoint him emperor. Um, and so if you've got the legions on your side, that helps a lot. Uh, and that can be difficult, like, because if you're at one side of the empire, the legions at the other side of the empire might never set eyes on you. And maybe they're commanded by a, a, a general that they spent decades with. That if he doesn't like you, they, they're probably going to be more loyal to their general than they are to some guy they've never met before. Um, and then the Senate, if you have them on your side, that makes a big difference. Some emperors were absolutely hated. Hadrian ended up having purges the Senate and the, the Senate in general despised him. Uh, but Antoninus Pius was loved by the Senate because he was kind of a career politician and they saw him very much as one of their own. And then the other one is just the population uh, in general being on your side because they, they see you um, as a popular figure. Marcus had the Senate on his side from the outset. Later, he got the army on his side when he went to the, the, f- the front and the northern frontier. He gradually won the respect of the army. And there's some things that, that tell us that. Um, but he, I don't think he ever really, or I think, I think he's kind of, the, the, the population at Rome and throughout the empire had a bit more of an ambivalent attitude towards him. Um, he, they didn't kind of warm to him the way that they would with some. Now, some emperors alienate the army and alienate the Senate, and that's a very dangerous situation because then their only option is to become a celebrity, a populist, and, uh, you know, through bread and circuses or whatever to try and win over the, the love of the population. And that's generally a, a very precarious strategy. Lucius Verus didn't have to really fight to defend his position because Marcus was like his patron, um, but uh, he was popular with the legions and popular, very popular with the general public. He would, Lucius Verus would be like a celebrity who um, like owns a football team um, and is involved in, in sport. Like uh, I think like Elton John uh, like owns a football team, doesn't he? And like so, so people like 
he was a big fan of the gladiatorial games and uh, very closely associated with the, the chariot races. And so the, the legions and the, the general public saw Lucius as a very familiar character, kind of more down-to-earth character, but also a playboy and a celebrity, someone that they, was more relatable than Marcus. It seemed a bit more aloof to them. Um, and Commodus alienated the, the Senate and, and the army, and he tried to follow this kind of strategy on his own of, of throwing expensive games and winning the, the love of the, the public. Um, but you could also call that becoming a sellout and, uh, you know, uh, uh, like uh, trying to become like a, like a reality TV star or a, cel- a celebrity or something today. When, when emperors do that, that's when they really start to become increasingly corrupt because uh, they forget about doing their job properly and it's all about PR. So what can Marcus then teach us about being better teammates at work? Because it seems like that is a huge piece of, of being emperor. And even I think Stoic philosophy talks a great deal about working with, with others. So what can we learn about being better teammates from Marcus? I, just as an aside, I'd say when people often have kind of a simplistic idea of what it means to be a Roman emperor, and it, even the Romans didn't uh, even really have a word that equates to our word emperor. For us, an emperor is like a king of kings, and, and that in some ways really clashes with what they meant by a, um, Augustus or an imperator. Um, so Marcus, some emperors ruled in a very autocratic way, like a dictator, but Marcus was very different from that, and so was Antoninus Pius. He made a point of as soon as he was acclaimed emperor, he appointed a co-emperor, Right. So he didn't want to be perceived as an autocrat. He wanted to be seen as perceived, perceived as ruling jointly alongside a, a co-ruler to balance things out a bit. And he wanted to be seen as a servant of the Senate and the public. And so allegedly the history, the histories tell us that any major appointments he made or decisions he made, he uh, sought approval first. Uh, from the Senate rather than doing things unilaterally. And also there's a remarkable, remarkable passage that Cassius Dio, a Roman senator who wrote a, a, one of our main histories, claims that when the civil war broke out against Marcus, uh, Marcus says that he would have been willing to step down as emperor and voluntarily appear in front of a Senate hearing because if his authority had been impeached by the usurper uh, of Adias Cassius, the guy, the general that started the civil war against him. And uh, he said, I would have answered the, the criticisms calmly and rationally in court in front of a, a Senate hearing and, and allowed you guys to decide. He said, I, I don't have to be emperor. I, I trust you guys to, to make the right decision. I would have just appeared in front of you. You could have heard his case. I would have told you my case. And I'd have been quite happy for you to decide whether I should continue in power or not. That's an absolutely remarkable thing to say. Even an American president today <laughs> would struggle to have the humility uh, required to voluntarily step down from power in order to appear in front of a Senate here if his authority had been impeached. But um, So in some ways, Marcus was, although a Roman emperor, a less autocratic ruler than some modern-day presidents or, or, or prime ministers. How is that for a strange concept? at least according to the, the, the surviving histories. Um, how could you be more of a teammate? Marcus wants us to recognize our own imperfection and bias that's integral to Stoicism, to realize that we are creatures of passion. None of us are perfect. None of the Stoic uh, founders claim to be gurus or perfect. Um, we're all on the same boat together. We all uh, have flaws in our ability to reason. And therefore, um, you know, to some extent, we, it's rational to consult others. And, but we have to try hard. The, pro- the problem in life is identifying people whose judgment we can trust, like you said earlier. Uh, but Seneca finding a mentor is a, a tricky thing. Marcus's physician, Galen, has a whole book about how to find a mentor. He says that you, you have to look for somebody whose life provides evidence of their character. Rather than just the stuff they say, you have to look at their record, as it were, and their track record, and like, have they shown wisdom, integrity, courage, self-discipline, and so on, uh, and learn from them. So, they, you know, to be a team player, I think we have to respect other people. We have to see the potential within them. 
while also accepting that they have certain limitations. Um, we have to lead by example rather than trying to hector or, or lecture other people. And we, have to, we also have to be philosophical about things and accept that things aren't always going to turn out as we wish. And, you know, that ancient Stoic principle, like we have to not get our panties in a twist if things don't always, you know, uh, turn out exactly as we'd like them to. That's what, you know, Marcus is essentially saying. You have to have a relatively relaxed attitude. He says, um, he, you know, a, a key to the way that Marcus ruled is in the meditations as a passage where he says that you can't expect to achieve Plato's Republic, which is strange. You'd think he would have said Zeno's Republic. He says Plato's Republic. It's a common cliche for you can't expect utopia uh, tomorrow. Rome wasn't built in a day, ironically, is what we would say. He said you must be satisfied if each day you make one small step in the right direction. And we can see from Marcus's legislative record that he makes small incremental changes um, towards the, the increasing the rights of slaves and women, for example, like, he couldn't abolish slavery overnight. Good luck doing that. He already faced a civil war. Like, if he tried to abolish slavery, he wouldn't have woken up the next morning. Like, you know, he would, uh, almost certainly, he would have been assassinated or, you know, there would have been a, a civil war throughout the, the empire. But what he did do was try to make small incremental changes in, in the right direction. And uh, so I think Marcus would say, like, sometimes you've got to kind of pick and choose your battles. And you've got to accept that there are things that you don't like, but you might not be able to change overnight. And nevertheless, remain committed to your goals and try, even if it's moving at a snail's pace, you know, as long as you're, you, you keep your eyes on the goal and you're still moving in the right direction, that's the main thing. And that allows you to collaborate even with people that you might not like very much or whose values you might not share, like, but you know, still just keep nudging them, leading by example, accepting incremental change like that's the, the slow softly softly um you know a patient uh, political approach i think that's typical of uh, some of the stoics thank you very much yeah i appreciate that i know we're running a bit long on time here there's so many other questions i wanted to to ask you but uh, we'll, we'll begin to wrap it up here uh, so last formal question before we jump into a quick random round it is 100 years in the future what do you want to be remembered for? Oh, uh, nothing. Um, I don't. I, don't, I wouldn't have any real desire to be remembered for anything. I'd like Stoicism still to be a thing. Like uh, I think it would have. It's a perennial philosophy, and I think it'd be cool if people are still studying it. Um, but Marcus Aurelius uh, talks about this idea of. Uh, you know, whether he'll be remembered in the future. And he's, it's strange, he's quite accepting of the fact that he thinks pe people will forget about him. So it's odd that we are still reading his book uh, and admiring the fact that he says that one day nobody's going to remember his name. It's mm -hmm. odd. I'll tell you an odd thing for Marcus was that by the time he's writing the meditations, there would be people that he met, statesmen and Roman officers, who only knew of Hadrian as a statue and as somebody they read about in books, whereas Marcus remembered meeting him and growing up in his court as a, a child, going hunting with him and stuff, maybe. Um, and I think as you get older, you know, you kind of have that ex strange experience of, of seeing how uh, time changes and perceptions change over time. Uh, but uh, I, I'd like to think that in the future, people would live in a way that's more consistent with Stoic philosophy and that Stoic philosophy will still be guiding them, but I don't have any desire to be uh, remembered uh, in the future. Very very Aurelius like of you. I really like that answer. So jumping into the random round here. First question is what are you currently most excited about or currently exploring? Um, I'm working on a graphic novel. I'm, it's a long haul, but I'm working in the middle of that. We've only just started coloring the pages. I've got the second colored page now. So first there's a lot of work. It takes about a year to write the script and get the whole thing done in draft or pencil form. And my artist, Zina Nofraga in Portugal, has just colored the second page. So I'm quite excited about that. We've just got Stoicon out of the way. Um, so I'm now, we're, this is kind of hush out. I can say very vaguely that we're in the process tentatively of planning a military uh, Stoicon type conference because over the years there's been many people. Earlier this year, I, I spoke to the Marine Corps University in Quantico. And uh, I'm, I'm kind of interested in, in the possibility of doing more work 
um, with people in different branches of the armed forces around the world in the future. And that's something we're currently looking into. I'm really excited about that graphic novel, uh, Verissimus, right? Is that how you mm-hmm. pronounce that? Yeah, I'm super, super excited uh, for that to come out. And then hopefully soon after, a animation. Huh? Yeah. Uh, so what do you believe that other people think is crazy? What do I... What do other people think that I believe is crazy? What, uh, what, what, thought, belie- what belief? Yeah, what belief do you have that other people might think is crazy? Oh, what's a belief that I have that other yeah. people f- might think is crazy? Oh, honestly, there are loads. Um, gosh, um, I don't believe that happiness is a feeling. Um, I believe that uh loving other people is more important than being loved by them i um i believe lots of things that i don't think it matters whether you die or not as long as you have lived um i i think uh being dead isn't a problem i think uh never having existed would suck but like uh, the fact that you've existed at all, I think, is is good enough. Uh, you shouldn't then worry about the fact that one day you'll cease to exist. Uh, that I get to, to people, maybe that seems crazy. But that, I, that the day I realised that was the day I stopped really worrying about dying. I thought it doesn't really matter because I used to exist. That's good enough. Yeah. That doesn't make a lot of sense to most people, but it makes sense to makes sense to me. That's how I like to think about things. Um, there are many things that I believe that, uh, like, that I guess other people think are crazy, but those are, those are a few of them. Yeah. I mean, I guess there's an infinite amount of time where you were not born and there'll be an yeah. amount of time when you're not alive. So, yeah. Uh, if you could have a billboard placed up anywhere, what would you put on it? Uh, what would I put on it? Uh, gosh, let me think of that. Look at, uh, well, whenever I say someone shoved a book in front of it, I think the first time someone put a book in front of me and said, can you sign this? I thought, I feel like I should write something on it. Um, and the first thing that came into my mind was a quote from Horace that says, dare to be wise. And so now I always sign books. I put dare to be wise. So I've, mm. And I, I feel like, I don't know if it's very practical advice, but it seems pretty fundamental to me. I said earlier, just, Asking what wisdom is is uh, a very powerful question. Mm-hmm. Uh, just kind of thinking in terms of making some effort to live more wisely would be the first and most important step in philosophy. It's, you know, like we can talk all day about what Stoicism teaches or other philosophies teach, but the, the fundamental decision to try to be a wiser person is a, that, that initial step that many people don't even bother to make. It's the foundation. I compare it to um, when I was a young guy, I, I briefly got into martial arts, I did Taekwondo and Jiu-Jitsu and stuff like that. And I remember um, some of the old Japanese karate teachers uh, would say, look, the most important thing isn't learning how to do a flying spinning back kick. It's your stance, right? And that's the foundation of everything else. And that seems like the most banal thing. Like, I don't want to do martial arts so that I can learn how to stand properly. I want to learn how to do flying kicks and stuff like that, like Bruce Lee. But uh, I think that's true of many subjects. Like the most important part is this, your stance. In Stoicism, it's not all the subtleties of the philosophy. It's the fundamental stance. Why, and part of it is daring to be wise. So that's what I would that's it. Daring to be wise is the, the, the stance that's the foundation of everything else in Stoicism. That's what I put in a billboard poster. I like that. I like that a lot. What are you currently reading? I am currently reading, what am I currently reading? Uh, like I'm listening to an audio book um, that I can't remember the name of, but it's about the history of disease in the Roman Empire, mm. um, but like plagues and, and stuff. Um, yeah, like that's, that's like the main thing. And I'm reading a bunch of stuff for work. I'm rereading a bunch of biographies of Marcus Aurelius because I'm about to write a biography of oh. Marcus Aurelius. So I have to go back and read a lot of uh, books that I've already read several times. I'm looking forward, looking forward to <laughs> biography. We're going to open up the random question generator just for a couple of questions here. Mm-hmm. All right. First question cool. is going to be, what's your favorite book? My favorite book is, I was going to say the Meditations, but um, the Apo- Plato's Apology is a book that I really, really love and I would recommend everybody reads it. I think it's one of the most 
beautiful philosophical text I've ever read. What is something you can never seem to finish? Something I never seem to finish is learning Greek. Mm. Uh, I'm uh, I'm not I'm not the best at languages, so I always seem to be kind of like starting it and trying really hard, and then it kind of my enthusiasm peters out, and I leave it for like a year or two, and then come back and pick it up again. I've never finished like uh, learning uh, modern or ancient Greek. What talent would you show off in a talent show? What talent would I show off in a talent show? Um, gosh, I'm sure I have some kind of obscure talents, but I can't think. Um, I'm really like I'm, I get really good at cooking something. I'm very good at making a Greek salad called dakos. Mm. Like I believe that I'm like the world's best uh, at that. So I'd uh, I'd make I'd make a uh, I'd make dakos for uh, for everyone. I'd love to try some of that. So, Donald, how can people connect with you? Where can they find you online? Um, my website has my e-learning site and there's a lot of courses and downloads and stuff and all my social media is connected to that. Um, and my web address is just donaldrobertson.name. So it's just my name, Donald Robertson. And then st- instead of .com, it's na- .name, N-A-M-E. And if they go there, they'll f- be able to contact me via the contact form and find all my other like, articles and videos and stuff. Yeah, I'll definitely be sure to include a link to that in the show notes. Donald, thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule to be on the show today. I really, really appreciate you spending some of your evening with me. Thank you. No problem. It's been a pleasure. Thank you very much for having me along. 